welcome back my dear friends I hope you have uh, make, made a note of all the points which we discussed in video 1 and are ready to begin the exam I want you to have loads of writing material paper and pencils make sharpen all the pencils and keep them so that you don't waste your time during the exam to sharpen your pencils and uh, you can use erasers if you want if you don't if you want to cancel out something I would recommend you even in your exams just make one single line across it and that means you have cancelled that answer don't just keep on scribbling on the on top of it making n number of lines it just looks ugly and distracting all the best to you all and good luck let's begin so you have 30 seconds to read the questions so first start reading question number one what aspects of history would you like to obtain further to rule out a fatal diagnosis a urine dipstick is normal what bedside test would be justifiable before requesting a chest x-ray what two scoring criteria can be used for the diagnosis under consideration now you start reading the stem Start writing your answers. You have one minute. let's move ahead with the right answers so in this case this is a young lady so I would like to ask history of last menstrual period and risk factors for a pulmonary embolism recent immobilization past DVT so basically I'm just trying to think about uh, the Wells criteria thing or uh, the Geneva score uh, in a young female in the reproductive age group what is very important whether she is pregnant or not a urine dipstick was done which was normal but it did not say that a urine pregnancy test was done so how about writing a urine pregnancy test or urine beta hcg so if you look at the question back it said a urine dipstick is normal what bedside test would be justifiable before requesting a chest x-ray so i would go ahead with the urine beta hcg in the first one some people could not get the right diagnosis if you look at what is mentioned over here they want a fatal diagnosis fatal diagnosis could be PE so you need to ask only about PE uh, what scoring systems will you use Wells criteria or BTS pulmonary embolism criteria Geneva score pulmonary embolism rule out criteria which is PERC rule 30 seconds ready what further history is essential apart from history of present illness history of she's come with bleeding so any patient who comes with bleeding you would like to ask about any history of bleeding disorders 
or clotting disorders, any history of trauma, any history of anticoagulant use. So history of antiplatelets or anticoagulant use, bleeding disorders in family, past history of sexually transmitted disease, cervical smears and obstetric history. So see, I have not written what is already given. Yeah. So I have written something which is new. You want to do a PV examination, she has consented for the examination in presence of her friend who she feels will be the chaperone. Can her friend be the chaperone? The answer is a straightforward no. She can be present but she cannot be a chaperone. And why? Because a relative or friend of the patient is not an impartial observer. Okay. That word is important. The relative is not an impartial observer. What things would you, what are the GMC guidance to be followed do you, while, while doing the PV examination? Everybody has written consent to be taken. See, she's consented already. Consent will not be given marks. And uh, because consent has been done over here in the question stem over here in number two. So consent will not give you marks while doing that means she's already undressed she's lying on the bed so while you're doing the examination what you're supposed to do is very important that's where reading the question is important so explain what you're going to do so if you're doing it she's ready in front of you you're going to explain to her what you're going to do before you do it and if you want to do something different from what you have told before explain why and seek patient's permission again so while she's lying down tell her okay i'm gonna have a look and externally i'm gonna inspect if there is any discharge any injury any bleeding or anything like that now i'm gonna separate the labia majora or external area to inspect the deeper aspect so explain what you're going to do before you do and if you and if this differs you need to tell the patient again that why it differs and why can I go ahead stop if the patient says stop keep discussion relevant and don't make unnecessary personal comments okay so discussion will be just based on your examination no other comments so this three criteria have to be met ready for the next one give you about 30 seconds to read and one minute to write the answer can start writing the answer. Okay, stop writing. Assuming a diagnosis of lithium toxicity, what is the likely cause of her presentation? So in this scenario, the patient is suffering from mania and well controlled on medication. The drug is lithium. She is complaining of vomiting and fine tremors. Lithium plus tremors, lithium plus seizures, lithium plus tremors, lithium plus seizures. 
is lithium toxicity okay so lithium plus tremors toxicity search for the drug which has caused it there are three groups of drugs one are, one is diuretic which is lisinopril over here ace inhibitor one is metronidazole and one is aspirin so uh, this is a drug interaction scenario so what is likely cause an interaction of the drug with lithium name two drugs with narrow therapeutic index so there are many drugs apart from lithium what ingestions do not require or activated charcoal this is very straightforward so lithium has a narrow therapeutic index and toxicity can be precipitated by NSAIDs ACE inhibitors ARBs diuretics yeah. theophylline gentamicin warfarin digoxin phenytoin carbamazepine these are narrow therapeutic index Alice P acid alkali lithium iron cyanide ethanol pesticides that's organophosphorus or organochlorus not OPC okay because in a hurry if somebody is reading it and he reads it OCP then it's like organo uh, oral contraceptive so don't write short forms don't fall into the trap yeah let's move on ready for the next one 30 seconds Apart from mumps, two differentials for left jaw swelling that is sialadenitis, bacterial infections, salivary duct stones, which is uh, uh, salivary duct stones, sarcoidosis, Sjogren syndrome, dental abscess, mandibular fracture, neoplasm of salivary gland. Some people have written lymphoma that has been given marks. What transmission based precautions? There are three transmission based precautions apart from standard precautions so standard precautions are your gown gloves and goggles transmission precautions are droplet or complete isolation or uh, airborne so in this case mumps is a chubby virus so chubby viruses do not go far away so droplet based precaution you have reassured the mother and have discharged the child with appropriate advice what would you do next? So she's gone home. This is this is where reading the question is very important. Some people have told, uh, tell the mother that the child will be all right, will have fever and all this stuff. No, she's gone home. You have reassured her, and she's gone home. Now, what would you do? So you're going to inform the public health department. You're going to tell public health notification that you just inform public health department either by email or by phone or by fax. You need to do it as soon as possible. Okay. Some people have written public health protection agency, which is not the right word. So, well, you might get marks for it but uh, I just found it all and uh, some people wrote CDC CDC is Center for Communicable Disease in America uh, it's so the examiners from UK do not know about it or even if they know they, they are not expecting that answer in India we don't have CDC at all neither it's there in the Middle East or in the uh, Arab nations as well so public health notification is the right answer let's move on to the next one
start writing the answer you have 45 seconds Let's stop writing. So this lady is here with vaginal discharge. She is a young lady. She is diabetic as well on insulin. She is not pregnant. Urine is normal. You, she declines to do a PV examination. Wants you to write a letter to the GP who will do it because she wants to be seen by a female doctor, I suppose. And she has a single faithful partner for the last five years. Along with swaps, what are the screenings are indicated? So this is health promotion question so every diabetic needs to undergo ophthalmic assessment annually so eye examination or fundoscopy is the right answer and every female in the reproductive age group gets a cervical smear or a pap smear every five year up to the age of 50 and then no, every three years up to the age of 50 and then every five years after that. Give two non-sexually transmitted causes of vaginal discharge. Most of you have got it right. Candidiasis, bacterial vaginosis. They are not sexually transmitted. Uh, if this was a PID, what are the complications that may occur? So the, this was a straightforward answer right, right from the book. So HPV cervical screening from 25 to 64 years so and this is it candida leucoria leucoria is whitish vaginal discharge which is non-infectious uh, infertility tube ovarian abscess ectopic pregnancy uh, these are the big ones some people have written septicemia I was generous in giving marks to that but in the exam try to remember two things uh, once you have a tube ovarian abscess your fallopian tubes are going to get blocked so if she gets pregnant, she's got the the whole embryo is gonna come and attach itself in the fallopian tube rather than in the uterus. So she, there is a high risk of ectopic pregnancy. So ectopic is a big one, and uh, sometimes the ovum just cannot uh, travel across, and uh, so she suffers from a infertility. In fact, the recent studies have shown that 12 percent incidence of infertility in somebody who's been diagnosed with a pelvic inflammatory disease so infertility in a topic is a big one okay 90 seconds for you for reading and writing the answers Okay, 
Let's see the answer. You have addressed her wounds and spoken to her about informing police. She declines to inform because she loves him a lot. What would you do now? Uh, it's a knife crime question. So any non-accidental knife injuries, you need to inform the police. So you just have to tell her that I'm going to inform the police because I'm obligated to do so. The law states it. What is the rationale for making this decision in STEM 1? The rationale is if he carries a knife, and if he can harm the lady who lives with him, then he can harm the kid. He can be harmful to the community. He can today he's caused harm to her, so tomorrow it will be for someone else. Name one nerve and tendon likely to have damage. If you remember the median nerve block, you know the two tendons which are there: flexor carpi radialis and is longus and one nerve which is median nerve so it was quite straightforward so flexor carpi radialis palmaris longus in the exam please don't write FCR yeah safety of the child is at risk and safety of public is at risk yeah good if you notice inform her and then inform police it's just like the DVLA thing if the patient is not ready to inform, you need to go the stepwise and eventually you need to inform the patient that you are going to inform the DVLA. So just inform DVLA will not fetch your marks properly. You write inform the patient that I am going to inform DVLA. Similarly, inform her that you need to inform the police. If the question asks why, then write why. If the question doesn't ask why, don't write why. Okay. Uh, from here onwards, what we will do is we will just uh, tweak this pattern a bit. I'll show you the question, you pause the video, give yourself a timer of 90 seconds, read the question and write the answer in about 90 seconds or in about 2 minutes. I don't want you to go beyond 2 minutes because you already know the question so, and you have an idea about the answer. So I don't want you to spend more than two minutes otherwise you will keep on if you if i give you three minutes for each question then you will write unnecessary things because you might have had looked up these questions and have learned it so you may be having extra knowledge um, and if you do some mistake in writing which is not ours that's not good that creates a bad impression so uh, pause the video at the next question give yourself two minutes maximum two minutes and uh, read the question and write the answer and then move on and listen to my dictation uh, explanation of the answers so here was the question about she suddenly deteriorates and is now very short of breath so a very significantly ill lady is here who has dementia and she's septic and you want to support her breathing with the niv as there is no advanced directive what assessment is necessary to obtain consent now she is demented that doesn't mean that she can't consent everybody is competent to consent unless their capacity is assessed so you need to do an assessment of mental capacity and the components are the patient is able to retain the information the patient is able to understand the information using that information the patient is able to make weigh the pros and cons and make a decision and convey the decision so these things are very important okay retain information understand information Weigh the pros and cons, make a decision, communicate the decision. The assessment was unhelpful and you decide to seek permission from the granddaughter. What statute can give the granddaughter right to make a decision? So mental capacity, she didn't have capacity, she doesn't have advanced directives. Uh, so can a relative become make a decision? Yes, in India, yes, but in UK, no or elsewhere in the world no so no relative can make a decision on behalf of this lady whether it's granddaughter daughter 
husband whatever unless that person has a lasting power of attorney some people have written advance directive again but in question 1 it was already mentioned that the patient has no advance directive so the some people wrote advance directive states that she can make a decision so advance directives there is no advance directive so you don't get a mark for that so the patient dies in the department after 3 hours coroner has asked for a detail apart from coroner's request in what other circumstances can you break patient's confidentiality so in general this question is asking when can you break so people have written terrorist activity and uh, other stuff and most of them have got it right but let's look at the answer so confidentiality can be broken if patient consents disclosure in public interest disclosure in public interest in brackets you can write terrorist activity and reporting non accidental gunshot and knife wounds okay ready to move on to the next one pause the video 2 minutes so we have done with the uh, common competencies and uh, we are moving ahead uh, with anesthesia so seven questions of common competencies were done and we are moving to anesthesia here you feel that the patient might have an anterior dislocation of the shoulder so uh, he never underwent surgery is a young guy baseball bat direct blow no nah, he's a smoker non alcoholic denies drug okay and will surgery okay not going to gp for last year then next step of management would be arrange an x ray paracetamol 1 g per roll plus codeine 60 mg per roll and uh, take consent for reduction that's acceptable you have confirmed your diagnosis what aspect of history would you need if you plan to use procedural sedation using propofol so you're going to use propofol what are the contraindications to use propofol one is allergy to propofol itself or allergy to egg proteins or soy milk soy soy protein uh other aspect of history which you can take in general for any procedural sedation is last meal you can't write there allergy to any drugs or you can not write the other aspect of ample apart from last meal in fact allergy to any drugs will include allergy to propofol itself so you cannot write that as well so you just write allergy to soy soy protein or egg egg protein and uh, you say last meal apart from propofol what other single agent can be used for procedural sedation you can use ketamine you can't use isolated fentanyl because fentanyl is an analgesic but uh, it will need a higher very higher dose of sedation so fentanyl plus midazolam you can use but here it says single agent and single agent would be ketamine give dose and route so you can give im or iv if you are giving iv it's 1 to 2 mg per kg if you are giving im it's about 3 mg per kg Let's uh, look at the question two of anesthesia. You can pause the video. Give yourself two minutes. So in this question, we are going ahead with a patient who looks like he's got an anaphylactic reaction, or uh, yeah, anaphylaxis. So his lips are swollen, and you need to intubate these people early. 
So what are the components and sequence of difficult airway proforma? You need to go through the DAS algorithm. If you Google difficult airway proforma, there is plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D, and uh, you need to know the four plans. You are not able to intubate him, and we have done a surgical quick name to acute complications. See, the word acute is very important, not long term. What initial ventilator settings will you use? So plan A is you do oxygenate and intubate. Okay. You initially you oxygenate the patient and you intubate. If you are not able to intubate, what you do is try to oxygenate the patient, bring his oxygen levels up and put a supraglottic airway device. So ignore the face sad. Yeah. Plan A is mask. You use mask and oxygenate and intubate. Sad. I've written over there is it means uh, supraglottic airway device so it's easy to remember it's like face sad wake up and uh, surgery so face sad wake up surgery so oxygenate and ventilate until wake up and plan D is surgery that's needle or surgical quick failure of the procedure can happen acutely that's a complication Surgical emphysema can happen, bleeding and injury to adjacent structure like thyroid, esophagus, posterior wall of trachea, wrong passage intubation can happen. What modes you can put the patient on is control mode. Some people even say assist mode. Or control mode ventilation, either pressure or volume. If you're using volume, tidal volume would be about 7 milliliter per kilogram, FI to 100 percent, PEEP of 3 to 5, and I ratio of 1 is to 2. If you're using pressure support, inspiratory pressure about 12 to 15, expiratory pressure 3 to 5, and I ratio 1 is true if I have to. Okay. Okay. Next. So the third question of anesthesia. I'm really sorry, you can't see the first line on it. Let me see if I can bring it down. Great. Okay. So uh, Give yourself two minutes and start writing the answers. So, chest X ray shows perforation, and uh, you're concerned about aspiration risk. What can be done to it? So, it's very easy. Selic manure, yeah. Selic manure or cricoid pressure, which we call it. Riles tube or nasogastric tube and aspiration. Intraoperatively, the blood pressure drop. In this question, I have got many wrong answers. Peripheral IV access itself. Two drugs. So. What would you do? You would use metaraminol or ephedrine, not dobutamine, not dopamine, not adrenaline, not noradrenaline. You can use phenylephrine with double dilution, but uh, ephedrine and metaraminol is the answer which we are looking forward. And they didn't ask you the doses, so don't write the doses because if you're not sure, don't write it. Okay. The surgery is done, patient is not waking up. What has happened? The patient is not showing any breathing efforts. Succinylcholine is likely used in this procedure for paralysis. So what what has happened? Usually, succinylcholine is very short, short acting. It should have weaned off by now, but it's not happening. So, what has happened here is succinylcholine apnea. If you look at the complications of uh, general anesthesia, one of it is succinylcholine apnea, one of it is postoperative nausea and vomiting. 
and uh, anaphylaxis and other stuff is there. So succinamethonium apnea. Okay, you can in the first question you can give metoclopramide because it's a proganid agent and it will, it will even reduce your post-operative nausea and vomiting. So that's a nice one as well. Uh, let's move on to the next one. Pause the video. Two minutes. Two minutes up. What is the next immediate step of management? What two methods of anesthesia? What will be the anesthetic agent of choice? Give strength, maximum dose. Okay, so this male is there with a cut on the left forehead and uh, nothing is mentioned about. Uh, okay, so what we are going to do is it, people have written clean the wound. Well, it's, it's not a good idea to immediately start cleaning the wound. I would say, how about giving some oral paracetamol and codeine? So paracetamol, 1 gram per oral plus codeine 30 milligrams per oral and prepare for suturing, take consent, oh he's already consent, uh, prepare for suturing would be the one thing or you can say yeah that's it. So what two methods of anesthesia? Direct infiltration in the wound of local anesthesia or supratrochlear or supraorbital block. What will be the anesthetic agent of choice? Something which is short acting and quick acting lignocaine 1% maximum dose 3, m, 3, milli, uh, 3 ml per kg uh, 3 milligrams per kg I'm sorry. Okay. After giving lignocaine, I usually do a proper cleaning because the patient allows me to do a thorough cleaning and explore the wound to see if there is any damage to underlying structure. So cleaning the wound before giving any local anesthesia or giving any significant pain medicine is not advisable. So this brings, you, brings us to the end of uh, anesthesia and common competencies. Let's move on to the next one. Again, pause the video, two minutes. Okay, so what does the blood picture show? Here, if you notice the blood picture, the pH is normal. And this is an arterial blood gas. So we can look at the carbon dioxide. So the carbon dioxide is 8.2, which shows, which says respiratory acidosis. So I would say primary respiratory acidosis. If you follow the ALS, strategy of interpreting blood gases first thing is pH second is hypoxia third is PCACO2 fourth is bicarbonates so uh, pH is 7.36 so it's normal oxygen is low so I would say hypoxia so what does blood picture show one point hypoxia you will get marks for that I don't want your proper uh, Diagnosis, primary respiratory acidosis, blah blah blah. What I want is okay, blood picture shows normal pH, hypoxia, primary respiratory acidosis, and bicarbonate is high. That means respiratory. Uh, this is alkalosis as well. So, but there is never an overcompensation. So, there is primary metabolic alkalosis plus primary respiratory acidosis. Okay. So, this is a mixed picture. So, you can say hypoxia, primary respiratory acidosis and primary metabolic alkalosis uh, you can say raised lactate so what does the blood picture show they have not asked your diagnosis what is the anion gap I need you all to write sodium plus potassium minus in brackets chloride plus bicarbonate is equal to 132 plus 3.2 minus 86 plus 39 and that will give you 10 
0.2 something but i have given marks for people who have just used sodium rather and have not used potassium because that's also an acceptable way to calculate but uh, i prefer doing both positives plus both ne negatives if this patient has metabolic alkalosis what investigation you do a urine chloride level if it's less than 10 then it's vomiting and diuretics and uh, if it's more than 20 it's barter ADC basically aldosterone barter syndrome current diuretic therapy and hypokalemia happy let's move on to the next one pause the video okay how would you manage his blood pressure initially so this is a male who's come with shortness of breath generalized weakness and bladder cancer chemotherapy I'm going towards neutropenic sepsis i guess what's the temperature absolutely now it's neutropenic sepsis confirmed tachycardia so septicemic shock how would you manage his bp initially judicious fluid replacement colon 0.9 percent normal saline up to 30 ml per kg or you can say 20 ml per kg bolus and reassess potassium is 7.2 what is the next step everybody who's done the mock got it wrong what's the most common cause of hyperkalemia on the blood gas be honest and sincere and think what is the most common cause it's hemolysis patient is not having any problems on the ECG what would you like even if patient gets a potassium of 7.2 do you want to immediately start treatment I would rather in real life I think all of you must be doing it is repeat the sample so what is your next step is repeat the blood gas and confirm hyperkalemia get an ECG if hyperkalemia start treatment what bedside investigation can be used to assess this was a simple straightforward one do a bedside inferior vena cava scan to see if it is hypervolemic or it is hypervolemic or uh, kind of uh, distributive shock so if there is septic shock Everybody got this one right, norepinephrine. Uh, don't write norepinephrine. People prefer not adrenaline as the answer. So write noradrenaline. So let's stop here and uh, I'll see you in the next video.